Um, so feeling left out, decided to challenge the validity of the estate plan um, based on uh, Aunt Clara's lack of capacity, uh, undue influence, and financial elder abuse. So I, I think this may be time for, for Judge Getz to, to help out. So it, for those who are attorneys or if you're involved with attorneys, so if, 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 if you're the drafting attorney, I guess, Judge, what steps would you take um, uh, or advice you give to, to attorneys to um, help in this situation? So I'm going to frame it a little differently. I'm going to take my experience on the bench and tell you what I want to know. And so I want to know about the initial contact that was made. In other words, have your receptionist keep notes. Who was it? Who called on behalf of the um, client, the potential new client? Um, what did they tell them, if anything? And who set up the appointment? And then the next thing I'm going to want to know is um, I want to see other documents, prior estate plans and things of that nature, because I want to try and figure out what is the change and is this something I need to be concerned about. I'm just telling you from my perspective when I was on the bench and these were cases that came up. And then the question was, was there a geriatric mental health assessment? And Dr. Trader is going to be talking to us more about that later. If the new primary beneficiary is a caregiver or out of an abundance of caution, you may want to get a certificate of independent review. I think that's super safe. Um, the one thing that I would, I know there's case law now on this, but make sure you get uh, someone to do the review who's independent of you and who actually would have the expertise to understand what they might want to look for so that they can really provide that certificate. It's not just as a favor to their friend. And um, in terms of signing the, the um, document, this is a little bit ahead of ourselves, but you might want to consider, if this is going to be something that's highly contentious, you may want to consider videoing it. You may want to consider having some independent witnesses. And um, as you're going through the documents, make sure they were signed in order, um, that um, each document is explained to them, that if this is on video, you go over who they've selected as their um, co-trustees, successor trustees, and the succession plan for those that follow. So um, I would just say that from the bench perspective, all of that information would really help. I can't tell you how many times I'd be on the bench and you know, you'd be asking the drafting attorney, well, you know, who contacted your office? And they would have no clue. They wouldn't know. And so that was, it would have been helpful for the court to know who it was that was initiating the contact. The other questions that, um, that you might want to be asking yourself is, how did, um, how did the potential client find you? In other words, I'm assuming you're not the existing estate plan attorney. Um, you'd be a new estate planning attorney. But I'd be curious to know how they found you. I'd be curious to know, as I said before, who made the appointment and who brought her to the appointment. And I also would want to know why they're not sticking with her um, existing estate plan. And um, I would be asking why um, they're making the plans that they are. And then there's your observations. You know, are you going to meet with um, Clara, Aunt Clara alone? And how does she react to that? Is she OK with that? Are the people who brought her not OK with that? And why? So um, those are the things that I would be looking for. And that information is super helpful. And then the last part is, maybe I'm not sure about Aunt Clara. She's 85 years old. She's presenting very well, but I'm not really sure that I have confidence in what she's representing. So I'm going to consider sending her out for some kind of a geriatric uh, mental assessment. And the question that then comes up is, are you going to send her to her typical or usual practitioner, or are you going to send her to an expert? 
And that's kind of, um, that's a question you're gonna have to assess for yourself. If you think that this is gonna be a contested matter, I would advise using caution. <coughs> and then last, um, use the tummy test. If it's not feeling right, then be cautious, get the assessments that you need um, before you're willing to actually move forward with the execution of the documents. So we're gonna talk about why someone would refer a case to a geriatric, for a geriatric mental assessment, and this is where Dr. Trader comes in. Yeah, and I must say that tummy test, there's actually some scientific evidence for that because, no, no the brain and, and the gut are, are connected, to, at least when we are sort of young embryos, um, from the same neural tissue. So there is, a, there is something to that. But what I would say is, much of what I do is very similar, and I'll get into this a little bit later, to what all of you um, probably are doing or should be doing as far as an initial assessment. The reasons, or some of the reasons that someone, a, a, a mental health professional would come into play is if you want more of a, to document cognitive testing. Now I will say, and I'll say it again later, that in my opinion, the, the formal cognitive testing that we do, the, the mini mental state exam that most of you are familiar with, or what's called the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, which is similar, are, are not the most important parts of, of the assessment, but, but it's something that many people know about and we talk about and, and there are numbers to, to, to go along with that. But if you want more formal cognitive testing, and, and if you're not trained in doing that, then that's where a mental health professional may come in. Um, but also you want to may, may want to clarify either the existence of um, mental deficits or the magnitude of those mental deficits. You, just, you know, somebody comes in and you say they're a little bit off, they're a little bit crazy, they're a little bit cuckoo. I'm not sure what's going on. Let me send them to a, a mental health professional. So that's another reason. Um, a, a third reason is, and I'll get into this a little bit later also, trying to link the what we call the, the mental function deficits with the act in question, because the probate code essentially says that, that whatever act this person is, is, has done or is considering uh, uh, must be, if there are any mental function deficits associated with it, that those mental function deficits have an impact on that act. So if you want to, to have someone help you link a deficit with the act in question, and then, there's this, uh, you know, that, that term undue influence. So there's some factors, more than just cognitive factors, that may play a role in, in assessing undue influence. Um, and, and again, we'll talk about that. But, but those are more subtle factors, again, where a mental health professional might come in. Um, if the person has more of an unusual presentation, they're a little bit quirky, squirmy, squirrely, uh, maybe there's some personality issues and you're, uh, you're just not sure what may be going on. That may be another reason for um, the referral. Um, and then next, let's say if they're medical conditions. Uh, some particularly, let's say if, if you've drafted a document and in the middle, uh, before signing, um, the person has to be hospitalized and maybe there's a change in, in cognition or if that person had a stroke, uh, or particularly if that person has a language defect, for example, from a stroke, um, and it's difficult to do that kind of uh, verbal interaction that you had previously, then that may be a reason to, to have a, a medical professional uh, uh, do that assessment. And then, not so much in this case, uh, because Mr. Cheating before death had already decided that Aunt Clara could hire him, but sometimes if someone comes to you that uh, obviously that you don't know and you don't, you're wondering whether that person even has the capacity or ability to hire you. That may be another reason to, to send for an assessment. So when I use this word capacity, I'm gonna sort of change it a, a little bit or link it to also ability. What, um, what I try to assess is someone's ability to act, someone's ability to communicate.